Hello everyone and welcome to our design review for the Omni Processor um, presented by our last corporation. My name is Stephen Lamb and my partner is Anthony Roma. So let's get started. Um, for, for the agenda today, we're going to first start off with company description, going over the origins of our company and the processor name. Then we're going to go into the processor specifications and then our enhancements and our future plans and finally finish up and wrap things up with the final Q&A. So starting out, um, company description. Uh, Tony and I, or Anthony, has founded this um, company. So we thought that we should name this company after ourselves. Uh, we're almost for his last name, not for mine, Anthony and Steven. And that's how we came up with our last. Um, Omni. The origins of our processor name is actually from the Latin word uh, omnis, which means all. Uh, we had a lot of great ideas that we wanted to put in the processor, so we thought all in one processor, hence Omni processor. Uh, we named the processor the Omni processor, which means the all processor, because we want to distinguish ourselves from the rest. Um, we also want to put all these different things going into our processor that we hope to accomplish. Uh, we want a powerful processor, but simple. So we model our processor after the MIPS architecture. But I'll say right now that our processor is not a MIPS processor because of some instructions that we support that the MIPS architecture does not have. Mm -hmm. So the processor specification consists of a hardware architecture, which uh, means that we have two different instructions or memory uh, um, modules. One is for the instruction, and the other one is for the memory. And the benefit of doing this is that we can access uh, instruction and be able to read or uh, write from the memory data. Uh, so we have uh, two data types, which is signed and unsigned integers. Uh, we have uh, 32 by 32 registers and three addressing, uh, addressing modes. Uh, the immediate register and register indirect. In the immediate register, we um, embed one of the operands within the instruction itself. So in here, we have an example of how we use the immediate offset on the branch instruction. So we sign extend the number, and then we pass two num uh, lower zeros at the end. And then uh, we add that to the program counter plus four. And then if the condition is true, then we save that back into the program counter but if it is not, then we just save that into a um, program count to just get incremented uh, by four. Uh, register is when we obtain the operands straight from the register file, and such as the add and subtract or any R type instruction. And the register indirect is the case of the lower end store, and that's when uh, the actual data that we want is not in the actual register, but it's a pointer. Uh, with the register contains a pointer to the actual data located in the memory. So another processor specification is that our processor has four, uh, four different uh, instruction formats. Uh, I'm trying to zoom through this so we spend more time talking about future enhancements. Um, so for our instructions, the top six bits are all zeroed out. This is going to be the address for the first source operand, which is RS, and then followed by the address for the next operand, which is RT. Again, this is the address for the destination register for the results. This is a shift amount. We do incorporate a barrel shifter and other shifts, so this will be used. Uh, finally, is the function code to distinguish the correct R type instruction amongst from the different uh, instructions. Uh, the next one is I types. We have an op code which will distinguish what type of I type instruction it's going to be. Same thing, operands, operand, and a 16 bit immediate value that is used with in, during the uh, I guess, computation of the instruction. Again, the third instruction in our format is the J type, where we have an opcode and we have a 26 bit jump address that is used to concatenate to, to figure out the next jump location. Uh, the last uh, instruction format we follow is the enhanced instruction format, where the top six bits is going to be 1F and uh, X, which is our key. Uh, these fields are dependent on what type of enhanced instruction it is, but for sure we know that the lower six bits are going to be the function code for what type of enhanced instruction we're going to be executing. Now moving on into the, or the actual architecture, we can see that the overprocessor is made of a control unit and an execution unit and two memory modules. One is the input-output memory, and then one is the data memory. Uh, now uh, zooming in into the execution unit, it's uh, made up of the instruction unit and the interior data path. And we added the two memory modules just to demonstrate how data is flowing through our um, processor. And uh, we excluded some, uh, all of the control signals just to make it clear uh, how data is flowing through our processor. Uh, now going into the instruction unit, we 
have uh, the instruction memory that we talked previously about, uh, two registers, one for the program counter, one for the instruction register, and we have a mux in the top to be able to decide whether we want uh, a PCN, which is a value coming from the ALU, or we want to select the immediate uh, defective address for jump or defective address for a branch. And we have a sign extended to be able to utilize the immediate offset uh, for the I type instructions. Uh, now looking into the into your data path, um, one thing to notice is that we added uh, two adders, and that was for implementing um, the interrupt and return from interrupts. So the way we, the reason why we add them is because uh, we save the program counter and the status, uh, the flags. In the, into memory, so we have a stack um, kind of operations. So we use them to utilize and leave the C, the LU, uh free, to so we can uh, be able to do some other operations at the same time that we are calculating the effective address to store uh, the program counter and the flags. And also we added a couple boxes to be able to decide between um, the data from the I/O memory or the data memory and a mox for the side when to, if we want to get the flags from the ALU or if we want to restore the flags that we already saved uh, in the memory. And now looking into the ALU, uh, the ALU is made up of four main units, the MIPS, multiplied by, and barrel shifter. Um, the MIPS is the one that does most of the operations which consists of logic and arithmetic. I multiply and divide, they just do multiply and divide. And barrel shifter is one an enhanced unit that we'll be talking uh, in a little bit. Uh, one thing to notice is that internally we have a 60 bomb, 60 bit uh, bus uh, unit, uh, buses, and that's because the multiply can produce a 64 bit output. And then we use the mouse uh, uh, together with the function select to uh, split those into a 32 bit register. Also, uh, the result of the MOX and the divide goes into two special registers called high and low, and they are only used for those purposes. And the barrel shifter and names uh, output goes into the ALU out that was in the previous slide. So, a couple of enhancements that we accomplished uh, successfully in this uh, in the processor um, was input output. Uh, input output is basically just a lower and store word, but instead of uh, accessing data memory, we're going to be accessing from IO memory. Uh, return from interrupt uh, is self explanatory, we just return from the interrupt. Uh, I'm going to stress the barrel shifter because that's one of the major enhancements we actually accomplished. Uh, the barrel shifter has, introduces two instructions that are not part of this architecture uh, rotate left and rotate right, and also we allow the, all shifts to be uh, shifted uh, by a variable designated by this field uh, up to 31 times. Uh, we don't say 32 because you shift 32 times to the same number back, or you should shift 0, it's the same data back. Um, special note is that this table shows the rotate left and rotate right because you notice that the, the opcode is actually 1F, so this is an enhanced instruction. Uh, we keep, we model it as the R type, and the only difference is that this is going to be populated, and the opcode is either 0x00 or 0x01, which designates rotate left and rotate right. Just to be clear, so the, the rotates definitely are enhanced, but the logical shift left is just a normal R type, right? Yes, okay. with the, using the shift amount yeah. field. Great. Uh, so here is the block diagram of where the barrel shifter is going to be in our IDP. Uh, I read box ALU because we decided to put uh, the barrel shifter inside the ALU so we don't have to add more data lines out here. It just goes to the same way in the ALU. A couple of key things to notice is that the function select also goes into ALU because we need to determine, or it goes into the ALU uh, from the baseline, but it also is used part of the barrel shifter. Uh, another one, the shift amount, we have to pull that from the control unit where it determines the lower five bits or the, the five bits for the shift amount to pass into a barrel shifter. The last little signal, control signal we uh, introduced was the E instruction, which is uh, set by the control unit during a decode phase where it decodes the instruction as an enhanced unit that just sets the signal high saying the instruction you're about to execute is an enhanced instruction. Uh, I'll explain more about that. So looking in the same diagram that Tony already presented, here's the barrel shifter, here's the function select. Um, if it is a rotate left, rotate right, the function select are going to be 0x0 and 0x01, which is why we need that uh, function select going into the barrel shifter. 
We also have the shift around going in and also the enhanced instruction. I'll explain more about these fields in a bit. So for the bail shifter, uh, first thing is that we uh, instantiate it in the ALU, measure sensitivity list, uh, data in, shift them out. Uh, this actually is a decode for what type of shift we're going to be executing. Uh, I'll explain more down here. And then here is the carry flag and the overflow flag, which we both determine inside the barrel shift module. And here's the data out for the result of the barrel shift. Uh, the next thing I want to point out is that we have a flag that we set in the ALU that determines if the instruction is a shift. Uh, to determine whether or not an instruction is a shift is that it has a rotate left and rotate right. So that's rotate left and that's rotate right. But we also need to add the enhanced instruction because we don't want to confuse it for the other instructions. Other than that, it can either be a shift left, shift right, or shift right as a medic. So if any of these cases hold true, the instruction that we're executing is a shift. Uh, why this is important? Because when we pull the control of when we assign the carry and the overflow flag, uh, we know the instruction is going to be a shift. We're going to be getting the flags from the barrel shifter. Mm -hmm. Same thing for the output. We're going to be concatenating it from uh, the barrel shifter, and the upper word is going to be zeros. Uh, finally, the shift type is just this is a simple must uh, or kind of like a decode. We're going to figure out what kind of uh, shift instruction we're going to be executing. Mm -hmm. uh, we, put, uh, we put shift logic left as zero because that's what we assume is the most used. So here's some source code for what we did and how we implemented it. Long story short, this is a giant case statement with all the shifts inside, and for each different shift, we assign the carry and overflow flag a little differently, but the off gen generally follow the same principle. Uh, for shift right arithmetic, I would like to point out that because we're going to be shifting right arithmetically, we're always taking the most significant bit and moving it down. So instead of just copying it down, I use the replication operator from Verilog to replicate it that many times. And the flags they calculate a little interestingly. Uh, if I know that I'm shifting right once, then I know that the least significant bit is going to be my carry flag. And using this function, uh, the shift amount is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, 0 plus 0 is 0, so the data in, the, zero, the least significant bit is going to be my carry flag, and this works for all uh, data in. The 0 plus is unnecessary, and it's just there for the base index for me, so I understand what's going on. Um, and there's a sh rotate right, uh, and that's what happens. So all the bits get sh rotated right, and the least significant bit gets shifted at the top. Same thing for the rotate left, same thing principle with the other way around. Um, here's our sh shift right uh, shift right logical and shift left logical. Um, it's very simpler. Code just cast it as in and then shift it accordingly and set the flag. Same principles. And then shift right and shift left. Except we're shifting in zeros and not rotating. This is nothing big. Or MSP. So, so the future enhancements that or future plans that we have is to uh, implement cache and pipeline. Uh, we actually uh, implemented. Uh, both of them. Um, so the main idea behind a uh, pipeline is that you uh, split your processor in different stages, and at each stage you are doing some work towards uh, completing your uh, your instruction. So in our case, we have a five stage uh, pipeline, which uh, it's from uh, page decode, execute, memory, and write back. Uh, some of the major uh, changes that we have to do is uh, add an extra adder to be able to calculate the effective address for the jumps and branches, and that's because we want to be able to calculate the jump while we are comparing and the two registers to make sure that we have to jump or not. Uh, also, we have to modify the instruction register, which uh, we remove the two uh, branches or branch and the jump uh, effective address to be from here. So now we're pulling those signals uh, from the big uh, execute state. Also, uh, in order to be able to do all of these, we have to calculate all of the control words during the decode state and move them through the pipe to be able to do the instruction and don't lose like uh, any of the operations that we are trying to execute. Uh, the way we implemented, we first uh, created a chart with all the signals that we were using, and then we said, okay, uh, the values at this for this instruction should be zero or one, or should be the present state, or should be like some many other value, and we put it into a Excel spreadsheet, and then from there we move into uh, doing the implementation on Verilog. Uh, also, the registers from the previous diagram, they are conceptual for us. They are not actually big registers. And the reason behind that is because we want to have the flexibility that if in the future we want to add more stuff or more instructions, we can just add them at the end of each instruction 
a register, for example, uh, in the instruction decode and execute uh, pipe, we can add more instructions to the execute state without disturbing like, some other values. And that also helps us maintain all the control signals for that state together and not spreading across a huge register. Uh, also down here we have some of the reasons that we added in order to be able to move the data through the pipe and not just control signals. Uh, also the pipeline is not perfect so it has some hazards or some problems and one of them is that while we are working in one instruction we might want that result for the next instruction but then uh, one way to solve that is by adding a programming unit and in the case of this example, we have a subtract and then followed by add or add and then a stop word. Um, so the, for, the job of the forward unit is to grab the content on, of the, uh, the output of the ALU out and use it as the operand, one of the operands for the next instruction, or in this case, the AND instruction. Also, since uh, for the OR instruction, since the data is not ready yet or in the register file, uh, what we do is uh, we grab the data from the memory state and we put it as an operand. And also one thing to notice is that we change our register file to be a latches instead of registers and that's because we want to capture data and be able to read it on the same clock. Um, in here we have a sample code of how we assign the control signals from the previous slide. Um, so we, have this, we still have a case, case statement, but we don't have the states. So the states were replaced by these two lines that were moving the data through the pipe and also uh, the control signals. Uh, so this is a diagram that shows the forward unit and the two boxes that we had to add and some of the control signals that we have to drag along in order to be able to take decisions on whether uh, we should forward uh, the data at this location or at this location or if we should just grab the RT or RS data. Uh, so in here we have the code for the two boxes that uh, was in the previous slide. And right here is the code for the forward unit. So in here we take into consideration whether we're writing to the register file. Uh, if the instruct in the operand that we're trying to use is the same one that is on the pipe already and if the address that we are trying to write is not zero. And the way we use the if and else statement is because um, we want the latest result. That means that uh, if you have already like, R1 or R2 in the pipe, then you forward once, you're gonna have uh, R1 in the memory state and in the ALU out state. So if we have another instruction coming that needs R12, we want to get the one, the result in R in, in ALU out, not the one from memory, because that's the oldest one. So that's why the reason we use an if and else statement. And lastly, the else is just, uh, if we don't want to forward, we just grab the value from RT and RS. Uh, so we tested our pipeline and we grab one of the modules and one thing to notice, I just want you to focus on the first two instructions, the Louis and the Ori, and the jump instruction and the branches are uh, right here. Uh, so our suits were correct. And so in the simulation waveform we can see how we are program counter, the first one on the top, it's uh, being incremented at every clock. Also our instruction register, which is the one at the bottom, is being um, fetched with new instructions at every clock. Uh, but uh, what I want to point out is uh, right here. So we know that um, the ORI, I mean the Louis, which was the first instruction, is trying to do uh, right here in the decode, in the execute state, is um, just trying to load data into the register. But then the ORI needs that result, but we don't have it there in the register file. So the forwarding unit, it's forwarding the value from the ALU out and putting it as a one of the operands. So by the next clock that the ORI is trying to do its operation, we actually obtain the right value. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 
right here is the the right back stay and as you can see we are riding at the neck edge of the club or, uh, or we latch the actual value when the uh, club goes low and that also utilized uh, help us uh, be able to read data on the same clock and down here at uh, the branches uh, we don't store the pipe to execute branches or jumps Instead, what we do is that if we recognize a branch, or the condition is true for a branch, what we do is that we can fetch instructions, but if we recognize the branch condition being true, we flush the pipe or those two states for those two instructions instead of the study. And the benefit of doing that is that um, we do not lose any, we, we don't waste any time if in the case that we don't branch. So the way we flush the pipes, just putting zeros into the control words that that, that specific state. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, we have one that does not branch, so we still fetch instruction. Uh, one that does branch, but so we flush those two, and then the program counter right here gets incremented, and we can execute the instructions as normal. Uh, so I mentioned those one uh, thing to notice is that we don't install the pipe and that's because we think that's uh, inefficient and we change the register file to be latched instead of uh, registers. So another future enhancement we would like to accomplish is actually finish over cache. Um, here is the cache and we designed our cache for the data memory and not the instruction memory. Um, another thing is that from the execution unit point of view, it doesn't know that there, that there is a cache. It just needs to know that when the data is ready, which is why we should uh, incorporate this new signal, this new output coming from the data memory module. Uh, also, we need a clock because we're going to have a finite state machine that will explain more in the future slides. I just wrote while we're there, Steve, what, what would, why did you make the decision to only cache data memory as opposed to instruction memory? Uh, because we were working on data memory first and then we, we couldn't finish the write, so we couldn't go up to instruction memory. Okay. So here's a block diagram of the internal things of part of our cache data memory. Um, here at the bottom is the cache controller. Here's the same signals we originally had for the data memory, which is chip select, read and write. We, like I said, we introduced a clock because there is a finite state machine within this. Also, the cache controller is going to be the driver for notifying the execution unit or uh, control unit when data is ready. So that's where the output's coming in. Above that is the cache memory itself, where we have uh, the data being stored in the cache. On the right is the same data memory we had originally from baseline, but we did make some changes. First changes for the cache memory, or well, in the cache memory itself, we have the hit being the output, so we let the logic to determine whether or not the cache is a hit or a miss in the cache memory. Uh, as for the data memory, we had to introduce a write ready and read ready, and again, I'll explain this more when you show actually the flow, the fact state machine. Um, and this is the block diagram. So we, our cache organization is direct map cache. Um, I chose this because we thought it would be simply and easier to incorporate. Um, a brief overview of what direct cache map means is that when you break the address down into tag and index, if the index match for two addresses, you're going to be mapped to the same location. For example, you have 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Since you have eight locations, this is your index, 0, 0, 1. Since these two addresses have the same index, 0, 0, 1, with different tags, they're both going to be matched, mapped to the same location. So when you're reading and writing these two data, they're going to go to the same location. That's a brief overview of direct cache. Okay, so cache terminology. A couple of things is that our line size is uh, 32 bits because our data size. Um, however, what's actually in the cache is going to be a 36 bit value. Uh, the first being the data bit, the second being the valid bit, tag is 2 bits, and the data being 32 bits. Tag is 2 bits because if our address is 12 bits, so we decided to make a 1024 cache line, uh, line cache. So that's 10 bits of the address, and the left, left over is 2 bits, which is our tag. Um, Data bit, what the dirty, sorry, dirty bit. What the dirty bit means is just an indicator for that cache location that the data is not in sync with what is in data memory. This is to keep cache coherency. Uh, we also implement write back, which means that if the data is dirty and we're trying to read to it or write to it and it's a miss, that means we're going to go check that dirty bit, then go write that data to data memory, then go get the new data back and bring it into cache. That's the reason for the dirty bit. 
The next is the valid bit, which is really just for location, contains a valid entry. This means that initially the cache doesn't have anything, so the valid bit isn't set. So you're only reading and writing when, uh, or actually you're only turning a hit or miss when the valid bit is set. Uh, and you'll see more later on. Uh, the tag, I explained that, it's just a field that's part of the address that the most significant two bits. Data is the value for the address. Um, and then hit, again, hit was in the cache memory, determined hit. If the tag for the location in cache matches the tag that's in the address, and the valid bit is set because that location is, is a valid entry, then we have a hit. Otherwise, we have a miss. So, uh, cache controller finite state machine that I, I talked about. Uh, here's the finite state machine that was in the book. Here's our modified finite state machine. Really, we're the same finite state machine, except we introduced a write cache state to simplify the complex logic route or troubles we're having with timing for the cache. Uh, just to instance of saving time, uh, I would just like to prove the finite state machine in the following source code. Um, Again, here are the data memory write ready and data memory read ready, the two flags that have to wait. Um, write back is when I'm writing into data memory, allocate is when I'm reading from data memory, and then both states have to go to write cache to so update the cache. And finally, I go back to compare tag. Reason why I need to have a bit of time to kind of delay for the cache to update before I can check the cache to see if the hit, if the tag, and the dollar bit would be set in this state that I move into other. Which means data ready, raise the flag, let the processor know data is updated. Mm -hmm. So here's some code. Uh, I just want to go with the cache compare tag because that's kind of the brute force, the main guts of what the cache controller already does. Uh, I broke it down to this is the read portion and this is the write portion. Uh, for the read, if we have a hit, all we need to do is go back to idle state because that location is valid. It's most up to date and that's the data that the processor should be getting. So we're going to raise the break flag and go back to idle. If it is a miss and the cache is dirty, this means that the data isn't coherent with what's in data memory. So we have to write that data back to data memory before we can allocate the next location, if this is a read, not a write. So the last thing is that if it's a miss and the O block is clean or not written, this means that the data is already coherent with data memory. So we don't need to write it back. The second thing is that the data is not valid, which means we haven't written to that location yet. So just go ahead and write that, or bring back the data from data memory to allocate it, and then write the cache. For the write, if the write is a hit, and the previous state, this is a bit of logic uh, for uh, an issue where we're having that we would keep going back to either state. Let's just fix that problem because if we're coming from the previous state is either state, that means we just came from the either state that the processor wants to write something. Then we're just going to go straight to writing cache if it was a hit. But if it was a miss and we come back around and uh, the data is already written, then we, our next day is just going to be idle because data is already raised. So we're going to set the cache, the cache rate a bit high because we already written data in the previous state in the right cache. Because we're talking about compare tag state. If it is a miss and the cache is not dirty, then we're going to go ahead and write to the, uh, we're just going to go to the right cache state because data is not dirty, it's co coherent, so right in that cache location. Because since we're practicing right back, we don't need to update the data since it's not dirty. Uh, finally, uh, miss and old block is dirty. This is when we go back to the write back state because the block is dirty. So you can't write to a new location because that data is not coherent with data memory. So you have to take that data in cache, store it in data memory, then you're allowed to write it to that location. Uh, here's the cache read, and we took module six from the baseline. If you look here, the effective address for this load word, which is a read, uh, is going to be 1001004. Since your address bit is the least 12 bits, our address going to cache is going to be 0x004. And the data memory at 0x04, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I'm hoping to get this value into from the low word, or from data memory. Uh, a couple things is, in the ALU out, the effective address is 1001, which matches, matches here. Um, hope I'm not blocking you. Uh, here is the fetch state, which one, decode, low word, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Notice this state is longer because this is the read wait state. We're waiting for mm -hmm. the cache to finally get the data back from the data memory, then bring it back up and say, hey, the flag the data is ready. Notice that the data ready, which is this line, it's high at the very end of the state. Mm -hmm. Going down, if you look at the data output, I think it's here, data output from the data memory, it's one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, which matches what we're supposed to be reading. And also, in uh, the, the cache memory itself, which is here, you see one, two, three, four, and you see a four in front. Why is there a four? Because I mentioned before that in the cache, there is a dirty bit, there's a valid bit, and a tags, which represents four. Uh, in this, we got the cache reading perfectly and with module six. Uh, the only issue we couldn't complete our, ta our cache was a write timing, was a write, was a cache write, because we were having a lot of timing issues uh, with the processor itself. 
Uh, the main problem was that the address changes between states, which causes us to read the wrong address in the cache and store that. Uh, example is right here. So in state 23 in the store word, the address is correct, 000. However, by the time we hit to write wait state, the address already changed to 0C0, and we were, were capturing the 0C0 when we should be capturing the 00. So the timing issue in the wait state, we're reading the wrong data in cache. So the result from module 6 is we have a little over it all working properly, but the write is wrong, mm -hmm. which makes sense because we never listen to that location cache. So we're going to have to cut you short just because we've only got 20 minutes left for the next group. Well, yeah, so, yeah so, so we can't go through it, but what no. you've done is great. Yeah, well, we've got another group to go, and we've only got 20 minutes. Okay. So thank you very much.